services, but I was just thinking, I was, I was sitting there, and I was just soaking this all in, and I'm thinking, you know, we start off with shout out to God, right? God, you're amazing. God, you're wonderful. We start singing. And then we go into this part. We go into the preaching part. May God speak to us tonight. Not my words. May he speak to you tonight. Through, through this message, may, like Grayson said, may his words come out. May your heart be filled with him and not me. If that happens, that's what it's all about. I'll be way happy. So, I've called the sermon The King's Table. And we're going to be in 2 Samuel tonight, chapter 9. We're going to kind of pretty much go through that. And there's a couple extra verses, but they're really short. And uh, I'll just read them out loud. But it's, so if you want to put your thumb in uh, 2 Samuel chapter, chapter 9, we'll be all good. You know, there's someone I'd like you to meet. Someone you don't know yet. And we're going to call her, oh, I don't know, how about something like, how about neighbor? And in a matter of speaking, neighbor is no one that you know. And in a way, she's everyone that you know. Matter of fact, there might be a little of neighbor in each one of us. I know that I've struggled with some of the same things that neighbor has struggled with. And I've shared some of the same thoughts that she has. So, with no further ado, Mark, neighbor. When's it gonna happen? Here I am, there you are. Here I am, desperate for love, for truth. What are you going to do when you leave this building? Are you going to share with me what you've been learning here today? Or are you just going to bottle it up and pull it out next week for your friends? Now when I say share, I'm not talking about every tactic you've used on me in the past. Like judging my every move, telling me I'm a bad person, pointing fingers, giving me disgusting looks. <laughs> and my favorite is when you tell me that I'm lost. I don't even know what that means to be lost. Do you really think judging me is going to make me change? Would it make you change? Now, I, I know I'm a bad person. I've, I've done bad things. But I don't need you to tell me that. What I need is for you to pick me up when I fall down. To be there when I'm broken. Yes, there's, there's something missing in me. There's a void in my heart that I don't know how to fill. You have it. You have that thing that makes you whole. You know that person that I need to know. So I'm watching your every move. I'm watching where you go and what you say and do. Because I'm desperate for something real. I need something genuine to know that there's something more here than this. I mean, this, this can't be it, really. And I think you know that. Listen to me. I need you. I need you to be here for me. I need you to walk out right now, ready and willing to do whatever it takes. Hey, it's, it may not be comfortable. It may not be easy. I need you to show me love. No matter the cost, show me what unconditional love really looks like. Stop telling me about this God of yours and show me who he really is. Honestly, I'll probably resist you. I'll probably argue with you and laugh at you. I'll, you know, even when you fall, I'll probably call you a hypocrite. Don't give up on me. Please don't give up on me. So I'm going to ask you, when's it going to happen? I 
I can't watch that without getting a tear in my eye. Because the world, our country, our cities, they're full of neighbors. We'll even find neighbors on our own street. <laughs> but I'm pump. But what does it take to touch a neighbor? Obviously, there's a difference between what's being done now and what needs to be done. How do you, we touch a neighbor in a way that makes a difference? Today we're traveling back in time, back to ancient Israel, and back to King David. But before we read, I want to set the stage. Because there's four main characters here we're going to be talking about. And the first one is, is King Saul. Saul has been anointed by God as the first king of Israel. And it's kind of gone to his head. Now this anointing, on the surface what they did was they, they poured oil right over them. But inside, it had a deeper meaning. A more divine meaning. Uh, God was, has chosen Saul and he set apart for his purpose. And the power went to Saul's head, but he was still king. And then God spoke through his prophet and he anointed David as a new king while Saul was king. This gets kind of crazy. And David was supposed to take Saul's place. And then the next character is Jonathan. He's Saul's son. So he's the next one, the heir to the throne. Jonathan is Saul's heir and he is his legacy. So if you have children, that's how you live on. That's how you're known. We'll remember Saul because we remember Jonathan, and you remember Jonathan because of his family, and so on. So Jonathan is his legacy, proof that Saul was around. Now, Jonathan was also David, our third person, his closest friend. So this is kind of a strange thing. The, the king anointed by God, and then David appointed an, as the next king at the same time, and Jonathan, the king's son, who's best friends with David, this gets a little strange, doesn't it? But there's all, all these connections here. And David and Jonathan, they were like brothers, even closer than brothers. It says that they were, hearts were knit together. They were warriors. And they loved each other kind of the way that I imagine like World War II guys would. If you've been in a fight with a guy, you know each other in a way that not everybody knows each other. And these guys had fought side by side. And so they cared about each other in a very unique way. And finally, there is David himself, who's just a boy when he's upstaging Saul's army, right? Do you remember the story of Goliath? And the whole army is quivering. The, all the Israelites' army, they're quivering. And David comes on the scene with his sling and his rock. And what's he do? He takes out Goliath. Kind of puts the whole army to shame. Now David grew up to become the finest warrior of all. And he got Saul's wrath for it. Saul's not happy about this. You're not happy when you're a king and you get put to shame. That's not a good thing. Finally, there's Mephibosheth. And he's Jonathan's son. We'll hear a little more about him later. But he's Jonathan's legacy. He's the proof of Jonathan, Jonathan's existence, so to speak, just like our children are. So leading to our text, Saul's kingdom is falling apart. He's a bad king. He makes bad decisions. And there's chaos, and Saul's planning to kill his replacement, David. Matter of fact, you can read in, in 1 Samuel how he's chasing him all over the place. David's relegated to living in caves with his mighty men. And there's several times when Saul's chasing him down. 
But Jonathan, Saul's son, he doesn't want to believe his dad's bad, right? We don't want to believe your dad is a bad guy, that he wants to kill David. So Jonathan and David get together at one point, and they decided to test this. Is Saul really trying to kill David? Well, it turns out, yeah, he is. He is. But Jonathan and David are so tight. They make a covenant. They make a pact together. And it's recorded in 1 Samuel verse, uh, or chapter 20, verses 14 through 16. And Jonathan says this to David. He says, And may you treat me with the faithful love of the Lord as long as I live. But if I die, treat my family with this faithful love. Even when the Lord destroys all your enemies from the face of the earth. So Jonathan made a solemn pact with David, saying, May the Lord destroy all your enemies. What's he doing? What is Jonathan doing? He's not only saying, you know what, I believe in you, you're my friend. May God bless you. May he prosper you. May there not be anybody to stand against you. He's, he's inviting God into their relationship. This is, this is more than just a, hey buddy, I got you. Jonathan is, is saying, I'm asking God to bless you. I'm asking God to be here in your life, in my life. And I'm asking you, remember me. Remember my people. Remember my sons, and my daughters, my family, if I die. This is a, these guys are close. You don't do that with everybody, do you? I mean, you just don't, you might have some friends, but do you ask God to like form a covenant with them, to bless them, to, to destroy their enemies? I don't think I ever have. I prayed for people a lot, but I don't think I've ever done that. This is what Jonathan does. So, a little further along in our story, Saul and Jonathan head off to battle and they're both killed. And David takes the throne. But it isn't quite that easy. It's not like he just walks in and sits down on the throne and says, okay, I'm king now because Saul's dead. That's not the way it works. So anyone with a desire to become king now goes, hey, Saul's gone. I think I should be king. And David has to fight off these king wannabes. Right? So he's in, in constant battles. Everywhere he turns, he's, he's battling somebody. So I have this, this picture of him. Maybe he's like Chuck Norris in a 20-man fight, right? And he's just taking guys out. Ah, yeah, he's, he's got him behind his back. You know, he's, he's bad. And finally, David eliminates all his outside enemies. There's nobody else left standing. At, the, at this point, you know, I'm not a really good strategist, but I would think, well, I've been on the defensive this whole time. I've been fending off all these guys. Now it's like a football coach would say. What's the best defense? A, best, a good offense, right? So let's take it to these guys. That's not what happens, though. That's not what David does. You see, they, they find, he finally defends himself. And I bet what David's army is expecting is he's going to take out some other people. You see, at that time, it was customary if you were the new king, when you came to power, you didn't want anybody challenging that, right? So first you get rid of the outside threat, and then what's left? The inside threat. Because if there's any of Saul's family left, what are you going to start hearing from people? Oh, well, that's, that's Saul's son. He should be king. Or that's his great nephew. He should be king, right? Well, the custom was you take out your predecessor's family. You kill them. That way nobody murmurs, nobody talks. You're king, that's it. There's no challenge. At least uh, that's the way it worked back in that day. And since we said that Saul and Jonathan are both dead now, what we really have is only two major players left. And to make this a little more personal, 
let's divide the room into two players. This side, you're going to be my fibble chef. And this side, David. Now, now you guys over here, my fibble chef, he's Jonathan's son, remember. And I want you to put yourself in his shoes, so to speak. So, you grew up in this, this era, all these wars. There's been fighting and fighting and fighting. Your, your grandfather, Saul, has been fighting. Your father, Jonathan, has been fighting. All these wars, the Philistines, it's all you've ever known. And now there's this new king, and you're still alive. Now this half, put yourself in David's shoes. This is where we pick up our story. David had just put down all the rebellion and has called in his officials. You've, you've finally got some time to rest, and you call in your main guys, say, what are we going to do next? So here's where our story begins. Second Samuel chapter 9, and we'll start with verse 1. One day David asked, is anyone in Saul's family still alive? Anyone to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? He summoned a man named Ziba, who had been one of Saul's servants. Are you Ziba? The king asked. Yes, sir, I am, Ziba replied. The king then asked him, is there anyone still alive from Saul's family? If so, I want to show God's kindness to them. Now, wait a second. The first time we saw this word, you notice this word kindness, now it showed up twice already here in the first three verses. The first one he just says, I want to show kindness, right? And the second one he says, God's kindness. So I was wondering what this word means, God kindness, and what would they say here? And were they the same? And actually they are. The first time he says kindness, second God's kindness. And the Hebrew word that David used here was hesed. And it, it does mean kindness, but it's so much more. You see, when we think of kindness, we think, oh, he's a, he's a nice guy. She's a nice lady. She, she doesn't smoke or chew or hang out with girls that do or that kind of thing, right? Or he doesn't either. But this hesed word, it goes deeper. It goes in further. It means unfailing love. It means devotion. It means mercy. It means favor, especially in a covenant relationship. And that's why the reference to God's kindness, this covenant relationship. So picking up the second half of uh, the verse here, Ziba replied, yes, one of Jonathan's sons is still alive. He's crippled in both feet. Mephibosheth, guys, you're crippled. Where is he, the king asked. In Lo Debar. Ziba told him, at the home of Makur, son of Emil. So David sent for him and brought him from Makur's home. All right, Mephibosheth people. You're off in low Debar, hanging low in low Debar, right? Saul's dead. And this region is, it, it's kind of small, but we're... Word travels fast at this kind of news, right? That Saul's dead, that there's a new king, that he's fought all these guys off, right? So you're hanging out here in the middle, in the back 40, right? And it's quite likely you've heard this news. So I'd imagine your thoughts are pretty occupied right now about uh, you're going to get the X, right? Because this is what happens in your world when there's a new king. And I bet you're hoping that no one knows that you're still alive. Well, then the king sends his men. King David sends his men to go find him. And they walk in. King soldiers. Get your stuff. We're going to the king. I'm thinking, this guy's digging his heels in. He's crying. He's down on his knees. He's like, no, please, don't. You don't have to do this, right? 
And the king's men, they don't know what's going to happen next. They, the king says, go get this guy. What are they going to do? They're going to go get this guy. Remember, you're crippled. What, both your feet? And lo, debar? It's like, um, well, like traveling from Tavares to Melbourne. Okay? A couple hours away by car, right? But these guys, don't, they don't have cars. Right? So they go get this guy. And he's crippled. I'm guessing, it doesn't say, but I'm guessing they're making him walk back. It's over 100 miles. You got crippled, two messed up feet. And you're thinking what in your head? The king's men's after me. I'm Saul's grandson. And the king's men are after me. I'm a dead man walking. That's what you're thinking, aren't you? And what about you, David, people? I mean, after all, you're, uh, you made this promise, right? To Jonathan, you remember a while back, right? It's a lot of times passed, but you still got this promise out there that you'd look after Jonathan's family. And you find out Mephibosheth is alive, and you sent for him. But do you really got to do this? I mean, who's going to know? I mean, David and Jonathan, Jonathan's dead. He's not telling anybody. And David's the only other guy that knew about this. Oh, wait, God. I guess God knows about it, right? And this guy, Mephibosheth, we don't even know if you've ever met him. We don't know what kind of guy he is. Scriptures don't say anything about him. They don't say he was a brilliant scientist. He wasn't a priest. He wasn't a mighty warrior. Matter of fact, the only thing we really know about him is what? He's crippled. And if you're in this, this time, how good is a crippled guy? How, how much are you worth if your feet are crippled? How hard can you work? Probably not much. And maybe he's a jerk. You know? He's one of those guys that maybe he, he should just die. We don't know much about him. But let's pick up at verse 6 and see what happens. His name was Mephibosheth. And he was Jonathan's son and Saul's grandson. When he came to David, he bowed low to the ground in deep respect. And David said, Greetings, Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth replied, I am your servant. Now the NLT, I think, is a little weak here. Really? Greetings! No, I don't think, I don't think that it went down that way. And, and it just says, you know, he bowed low to the ground and, and, and respected David. I want to read you out of the NASB. It says, Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, and the grandson of Saul, came to David and fell on his face, prostrated himself, and David said, Mephibosheth, and he said, here's your servant. This guy's thinking he's going to die, right? David? It's, it's, he fell on his face. He's prostrate. In other words, he's, don't kill me. Right? It's not just greetings. Good to see you. He thinks he's going to die. I'm your servant. Whatever you want. Maybe there's a way out of this. He don't know. So given the circumstances, I have no doubt that the poor guy is scared witless. And he's on the floor, face down in front of the king. And after all, according to the culture, this is what's going to happen. And he's just marched, maybe, 100 plus miles. And think about this is going through his head. Wow, great. Why didn't they just kill me back there? Maybe there's a way out of this. I mean, every scenario would go through your mind. What if this happened? And what if that happened? But most likely, he's gone through every one of those. And he's just come up empty. And he's gone, 
you know what? There's no way out of this. I lose every time I think about it. This is not going to end well. Verse 7. Don't be afraid, David said. I intend to show kindness to you because of my promise to your father. Talk about mercy. According to their culture and their custom, my fiddle chef deserved to die, but out of devotion to God and devotion to Jonathan, David gave him something he didn't deserve. He gave him life. We have no trouble understanding this. If he was a great man, if he was Mephibosheth, was some pillar of the community, but he wasn't. He's a cripple. But David didn't show mercy because Mephibosheth deserved it. As a matter of fact, we have no idea what kind of guy he was, and the text never says. So, evidently that was no concern of David's, was it? He wasn't thinking about what this guy could do for him at all. The only thing that mattered to David was living up to his covenant, his promise that he made his closest friend all that time ago. So David restored his life. Mercy is a hard thing to understand. We don't get it. There's a story about a woman whose son had committed a crime. Not only once, but twice. The same crime. And this is the days of Napoleon. And her son was sentenced to die for this. So she went to Napoleon and she pleaded with him. She said, please have mercy on my son. And Napoleon says, hey, he's, he's committed the same crime twice, twice. It calls for his death. That's justice. And she says, I didn't ask for justice. I asked for mercy. And he says, but he doesn't deserve mercy. And she said, that's why it's called mercy. Because if you deserve it, it's not mercy. She had him. And Napoleon, as the story goes, released her son at her request. So as followers of Christ, we've all received that, haven't we? The mercy. We know this all too well, don't we? Or we should. Romans 5, 8. You guys all know that probably, right? Just in case you don't. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It's mercy. We deserve this. We got this. Didn't deserve it. No qualification whatsoever. We were so far away from deserving it that God had to make a way to save us. That's when God paved the way to our res restoration. And he didn't concern himself with who we are or whether we were deserving of this. It was out of his mercy that this happened. He concerned himself with living up to his covenant, his promise, because that's who he is. And he said he would save, and he does. And that's just like our David in this story, isn't it? So let's pick up the second half of verse 7. David says, I will give you all the property that once belonged to your grandfather Saul, and you will eat here with me at the king's table. Mephibosheth bowed respectfully and exclaimed, Who is your servant that you should show such kindness to a dead dog like me? 
He knows he doesn't deserve it, doesn't he? And he's blown away. He's, he's marched there the whole way, 100 miles plus, fell on his face, expecting death at the king's hand, and this is what he gets. Now it's one thing to grant mercy, to save his life, to spare his life. That's, that's, that's amazing, right? That David didn't just kill him and say, well, out of here. It's another matter altogether to give something to someone who doesn't deserve it. Giving something undeserved. We call it grace. It's grace. And he gave, David gave him back family land, gave him a permanent invitation to dine at his table. And in this culture, this is like he puts on a, a shirt that, that lights up that says, protected by the king, right? Because you're eating at the king's table. Oh, man, you're in, buddy. Nobody's touching you. I'm at the king's table. This is a place of honor, dignitaries, special people. You just don't eat at the king's table. His family eats there. This is what David's done. This goes way beyond mercy. This is grace. So imagine if you can, all of these kinds of things running through your head right now if you're Mephibosheth, and you hear that not only your life's restored, but your right to continue life, a better life, has been restored too. What a beautiful thing that is. He was a dead man not too long ago. And now he's what? Sitting at the king's table. Grace is amazing. There's a story that Max Lucado tells about a girl named Christine. She lives out in the back 40 in some place in poverty with her mom. It's just the two of them. They don't really have too much of anything. But Christine's young, and she's beautiful, and she's excitable. She's got beautiful brown eyes and a smile that'll melt your heart, and she's got dreams and hopes. And there's a city not too far away. And she wants to go so bad because she knows that, you know what, I've got what it takes. I can make my way. It'll happen there for me. My dreams can come true. But her mom says, no, no, you can't go. And then one night, after her mom has went to bed, she's fast asleep, Christine sneaks out a window and heads off to the city. Her mom wakes up the next day and Christine's gone. Remember, she's poor. They're a poor family. So she works and works. And finally, her mom gets enough money to get a bus fare to make it to the city. And she goes there. And the first thing she does is she finds one of those photo booths, you know. You get all the little pictures. And she spends all the dimes she has getting pictures of herself of which then she goes to every seedy hotel, every bar, every corner, and she posts these things with a little message on the back, hoping somehow Christine finds one. Well, she does this for as long as her money holds out, but eventually she's got to go back home and she leaves. A few weeks pass. Christine's coming down the stairs of one of those seedy hotels because to survive in the city, no matter how beautiful you are, there's a price to be paid. And she's had to pay it. And she's thinking as she walks down those stairs how good it was when she was back at her mother's house and how nice it would be to not have to sleep in someone else's bed but to have her own back again. And she moves down those stairs, her eyes, once sparkling brown eyes, full of life, don't look that way anymore. Because she knows how hard life can treat you and how tough things can be. But she looks up 
And across the way, there's a mirror. And on this mirror, she recognizes a face she hasn't seen in quite some time. It's her mom. It's one of the photos that her mom has posted on this mirror in this hotel. And she runs over to it, and she grabs it. And on the back of it, it says, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what you've become. It doesn't matter. Please come home. And she does. Because sometimes when you get so far away, home seems so far away. You can't go back. It seems like there's too much shame to go back. There's too much heartache to go back. You don't know what I've done. You don't know what I did. I can't go back. They wouldn't accept me. There's, there's just too much guilt. You don't know all the things that I've done. And this has kept Christine a slave. The fear has made her a slave. But on hearing this, her mother's unconditional forgiveness and pleading, just come back. And she does. And she's restored by it. She's made whole by it. So what does it look like for us to extend grace, that kind of grace, that I'm welcoming you back no matter where you've been? Colossians 3, verses 12 through 14, tells us a great deal about what it looks like to be gracious. And I like the way that the English version puts this. It says, God loves you and has chosen you as his own special people. So be gentle, kind, humble, meek, and patient. Put up with each other and forgive anyone who does you wrong. Just as Christ has forgiven you, love is more important than anything else. It is what ties everything together. That's grace. Grace is love and it ties everything together. Did you hear what Paul said? And this is what God is all about. When we're talking about God's kindness, his hesed, his devotion, his mercy, his grace. If you take away one thing tonight, take this away. God's kindness given through us has the power to restore people. Just like Christine and her mother. Her kindness and her love restored Christine. God's kindness given through us has the ability to restore other people. The first facet of God's kindness that David's stories demonstrate is mercy. That we don't get something that we should deserve, a punishment most likely. Next one is grace. That we get something we never earned that goes way beyond. And finally, there's a third facet to God's kindness. Let's finish up our story here. Start off in verse 9. Then the king summoned Saul's servant Ziba and said, I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons and servants are to farm the land for him and produce food for your master's household. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, will eat at my table. Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Ziba replied, Yes, my lord, the king, I am your servant, and I will do all that you have commanded. And from not that time on, Mephibosheth ate regularly at David's table, like one of the king's own sons. Mephibosheth had a son named Micah. And from then on, all the members of Ziba's household were Mephibosheth's servants. And Mephibosheth, who was crippled in both feet, lived in Jerusalem and ate regularly at the king's table. I'm going to start with the, the David people this time. David, what are you thinking? Haven't you already done enough? I mean, you saved this guy, right? You were merciful. You didn't kill him. And you should have, right? According to all rights. And, th and then you went further than that. And you, 
You made him part of your family and you, you gave him a seat at your own table. And if that wasn't enough, now, oh, wait a second, you're going to give him all this land and servants? David, what are you giving away everything for? This is your stuff, right? You're king. You earn this. It, all the stuff from the old king goes to the new king. And you're giving it away to this guy you don't even know. Is this really necessary? I mean, it's all rightfully yours. And think about that. It's rightfully all yours as king. And my fibble chef people. Whoa. Can you believe this? This is cool. This is amazing. You came here expecting to die. You went face down on the floor, and the next thing you know, you're eating at the king's table, and then he says, you know what? You're part of my family, and I'll restore you, and you're a whole family, and I'm going to give you a servant. This, this stuff doesn't happen every day. This is incredible, right? The thing is, you're treated like somebody who matters. And you didn't think you were, were you? You didn't think you mattered. All of a sudden, you found out you did. And that's pretty cool. Now, David certainly didn't have to share anything, but he did. And he went out looking for you, didn't he? Sent his men after you. Why? So he could show you unconditional love, didn't he? And David, you, you made him part of your life, right? Welcome to the family. Why? So you could show him unconditional love, right? And, and you made sacrifices too, didn't you? You gave up what was rightfully yours. Why? So you could show him unconditional love, right? Yeah. And all this, and he didn't think of what he was going to get in return. I don't think he could have, Mephibosheth could have gave him anything anyway. But David didn't do it for, for that. And did you catch it? Did you notice this last thing about God's kindness? The third facet, it's sacrifice. Loving people unconditionally will cost you something at some point. It's not free. It's, it, and you know what? It might cost you something that you don't want to give away. As David, I don't know that he wanted to give away all those lands and all those servants. I don't know. It cost him. Sometimes to love unconditionally you have to give up something. You have to sacrifice. There's a story of a very close friend of mine who went through a divorce and I wanted to to read this to you because it it illustrates this. She says, uh, about 10 years ago my first marriage ended and like most divorces it was ugly and traumatic. I harbored anger until it grew into bitterness and resentment. The hate grown inside me nearly destroyed me before I realized I needed to forgive him and move on. Forgiving someone who had hurt me so deeply was not something that I was able to do on my own. It took a lot of prayer before I could do it. And then just weeks ago, I found myself back in the same situation, having to forgive my ex-husband for yet another thing. This time, I was angry about having to forgive him for so much. I was wrestling with God over the idea. I really didn't want to, and I just didn't think I, I should have to. I put the idea aside and sat down with my Bible. My thought was that if I would spend some time reading and spend some time in prayer, then I would try to decipher, what was God trying to teach me and tell me through this? And I've been reading the book of Romans and left off at the end of chapter 11, so I picked up at chapter 12. 
And I'm reading through the verses, and then I get to verse 9. And I read, don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold on to what is good. I know my eyes finished the verse, but my heart and my head came to a screeching stop. Really love them part. So I read it again. Then again. Then with tears in my eyes, I read it again. But this time I read, don't just pretend to love Sean. Really love him. I can make all kinds of excuses for why I should have to, shouldn't have to love him. He wronged me. He wronged my children. There's no gray area here. It's black and white, plain and simple. He was in the wrong. Didn't that verse just say that I should hate what was wrong? Yeah, it did. And I could appease myself with that if that was the wrong that it truly meant. But I'm not sure. It seems that it all boils down to love, she says. I want to stop there for just a second. Because Galatians 5.14 says, For the whole law can be summed in up to this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now that sounds like such a simple thing, but as this story goes, it's not, is it? Because it requires that you know a few things. It requires us to know who we are in order to love our neighbor. And who are we? We are created by God. We are knit in our mother's wombs. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. We are his beloved children. And he is so involved with us, he even knows how many hairs on my head, which is not a tough task. <laughs> but he also knows how many hairs on all your heads. She goes on, she says, he loves, meaning God loves Sean, every bit as much as he loves me. And I believe the wrong that I'm supposed to hate here is the way that I've ignored that fact. By ignoring the fact that he is also one of God's beloved creations, I've devalued him. I believe that's the wrong I am to hate. So that's what God is asking me to sacrifice in order to love my ex-husband. I have to sacrifice my thoughts of who is right and who is wrong. God is act, asking me to accept him unconditionally and at face value. Mercy, grace, and sacrifice. Sometimes it'll cost you something you don't want to pay. Sometimes it'll cost you the idea of right and wrong. So why? Why is the question of the day, why does it matter to ex if we extend mercy? Why does it matter if we give grace? Why does it matter if we sacrifice from time to time? Who's really going to care? Let's go back and talk to neighbor. Mark, if you'll have that uh, video ready. She's opened herself up to us tonight, our neighbor. And let's see what she has to say about it. Listen to me. I need you. I need you to be here for me. I need you to walk out right now, ready and willing to do whatever it takes. Hey, it's, it may not be comfortable. It may not be easy. But I need you to show me love. No matter the cost, show me what unconditional love really looks like. Stop telling me about this God of yours and show me who he really is. Stop telling me about this God of unconditional love and show me who he really is. 
There's your money line. There's the, there's the point, isn't it? This is what we're all supposed to be about. We've been given so much. God has filled us with his kindness. God's kindness is given through us to help what? Restore people. But this isn't just because we're so nice. We, remember, we didn't deserve his grace. We didn't deserve his mercy. We didn't deserve the sacrifice. So what's the catch? What's the deal? You got to pass it on. You got to give it to somebody else who doesn't deserve it. You got to love like, like, and it's going to hurt. It's going to stink and hurt. There's going to be a cost. We're made in God's image. We're made to glorify him. What does that mean? We're made to do what he does to point to him. Why do you love like that? Because God loved me that way. Why do you care about that? Because God cared about me like that. Why do you sacrifice like that? Because God sacrificed for me like that. That's what we're called to do. That's grace. That's unconditional love. So what's holding us back? From that person, from that neighbor. They're out there. What are you waiting for? You got all the tools. You got all the love. You got all the power of Christ. Let it go. Let him work in you. Let go of the pride. Let go of the shame. Let go of the other stuff. Ask him to help you with it. He will. And start loving. Start caring. You were born for this. And he died for that. close in a prayer. Father, I, I thank you for reaching out. I thank you for being with us here today. Thank you for teaching us what it means to truly love. The prayer of St. Francis fills my mind. And Father, I pray that it will fill each of our hearts today and every day. Lord, make us an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let us sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. There is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. Father, grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, and it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is dying that we are born to eternal life. We lift this prayer in the holy and precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.